It's quite compelling for me as a Canadian um, and a newcomer. My parents were newcomers to this country to step back and think about the shifts that are happening in our economy and in society, you know, in the world at large and then reflect on the opportunity, the challenge, but also the opportunity to do it better and to do it different, I think, in Canada. Um, a couple of words that I heard in your discussion before this was your term of pleasant persistence. Um, I, think, um, I think pleasant is, it speaks to listening and collaboration, and persistence means that we have to stick with this over time. And, and humbly, I will say, as I get into some of the Humans Wanted work and some of our own experiences inside RBC, humbly, I will say that there's a lot of trial, there's a lot of error, there's a lot of discussion and a lot of reflection behind what I'm gonna share. It is by no means, because it can sound like this picture of perfection, and it is far from that. It is a journey of trial and error and discussion and reflection. So. As I've already said, I do believe this is, as a society, we're undergoing one of the most challenging and what it, I believe is a secular shift, um, one of the largest secular shifts in generations. We've got longer lifespans to rapidly evolving technology, greater career mobility, and the degree of change we're experiencing in our lifetimes today is either almost or is unprecedented um, as a society. And it does raise a number of crucial questions that we have to answer as, as leaders together. How do we educate and prepare a population for jobs that are, by, uh, that are either being fundamentally rewritten in the short term or don't even exist yet? It's a reality that you live with in your world in continuing education and it's certainly a reality that we live with as a company and we see it with our clients. It's a reality that my colleagues and I and others um, have been focused on for the past four years. And I'll, later on, I'll talk about it. In the part of the organization that I um, have responsibility for, um, we're preparing and reskilling about 25,000 frontline employees, um, frontline advisors that are everyone from a teller or what we call a client advisor in a branch to a fully accredited financial advisor that's gonna help you achieve your retirement goals or your kids' education goals. And, we're, and we have this job of bringing them on this journey and ultimately preparing them for a bank or an organization and a society that will be radically different, not 20 years from now, but within the next three to five and then the next three to five. Um, so it's happening within people's careers. There's a lot of discourse already about the skills revolution, as you all know well, and my remarks are gonna focus um, on what research is telling us in terms of where the opportunities and the challenges lie. Again, our experience in managing these dimensions of change among our own workforce, and then just some conclusions that we've drawn so far, and then um, I look forward um, to not being on the hot seat and being with my colleagues for what, what will be a great discussion. To start off, I want to share with you a short video, and it's a story. And it's a story about a young woman, Leah. She's one of our client advisors based in Hamilton. She's been with us for eight years. She's a graduate of Niagara College. She's got a, a degree in business and hospitality management. She doesn't work in a traditional branch or on a street corner. She actually works at RBC at campus at McMaster University. And our location at McMaster is not a bank branch. It is a location to bring financial literacy and help to students as they navigate one of the most stressful transitions in their life. She doesn't stand behind a teller wicket or work in an office waiting for customers to walk in. She's often out covering the campus, meeting with students or faculty, participating in campus events, because that's how she connects with clients. And that's how she connects with the university community. She's helped students develop budgets for the first time in their life. She's accompanied them for student loan applications. She's been asked for resume advice. She's asked constantly for career advice. 
She's hosting forums where we bring in our business clients with students to help them think about different career paths. And these students see her as a trusted advisor. So let's, let's watch the video. Me and my family grew up in a tough neighborhood in Toronto. Uh, we didn't have much money growing up. My dad, like, he's been a taxi driver like pretty much all his life. Like, he gave away his job being a teacher so he could come to Canada. My mom was working like two jobs. We had our financial challenges, but my parents just made sure all of us focused and like got on the right track. Becoming a student is probably, and going to university, is probably one of the first big life events that we take on individually. And so that has been a big journey for us for a couple of years, is really helping students start to build independence in their own financial well-being. I remember like two minutes before like you have to accept the university deadline, like I click McMaster, and then like a minute later I get an email about like, I have like a $500 deposit for residence, and then that's when things started getting real. He was very open and, and I appreciated that. He was really open with me about not having a huge understanding of financial literacy, which unfortunately is the case for a lot of individuals and a lot of students here. I came to RBC and that's when I first met Leah. At first I just, I forgot what I came for. I think I just wanted to know about OSAP because like I didn't really know how it worked. I just, I just knew that next thing you know, like $10,000 in your account, what do you do with it? I was honestly worried how much of that money would go towards Burger King. Like all jokes aside, my biggest concern was just spending it the wrong way and not only not having enough money for school, but not having enough money to eat, to have housing and all those kind of things. You know what, I said to him like, I can help you with that. And you know, I had to ask a lot of those tough questions and with those tough questions do unfortunately come some tough answers. It was really when I found out that there was a need for um, a little bit more of a discussion, a little bit more of help. And like, I still remember she like stayed with me for a while and she was calling OSAP. And in the back of my head I was thinking like, why is this lady that, why is this woman that I barely know like going so much out of her way for me? Then I, I knew that, you know, we need, also needed help. So we leveraged the school facility, so the financial aid service, where we came up some, with some questions that actually brought him over to the financial aid, where we got a lot of the information that we needed. Um, but I know that he, you know, kind of wanted me there with him to be able to make sure that we got all the points and we had him set up. So that way I knew come September he was getting X amount of money and then I could budget that for him for the rest of the year and through the summer. I, I won't forget walking in with Leah because, like, I was nervous. The fact that she walked with me and like kind of took her break to like make sure I felt good, it made me not only feel valued as a customer, it made me feel like respected as a person. Over time, like I started coming more and more, like she helped me build my budget. Um, she noticed I'd come after practice some days, so she's like, you're hungry, why don't you get a protein bar? The way she like fully opened up to me, I felt like we were actually having like a conversation with like substance that like wasn't strictly financial. So then I started realizing like, this is a place I could go to all the time. Like whether it's money, whether it's protein bars or whatever. He's so close, he's got so much potential. He is, he is like so smart too. And he's a great athlete and he's got so much going for him. So I just want him to make it. <laughs> I really believe we went into this thinking we were just going to be able to speak with students and impact students, and yet what we've done is impact lives. Yeah, RBC, like especially this branch, has given me a lot more than just banking because I came into university needing, I thought my main thing was financial help, but I realized, I came into university realizing I needed a lot of personal growth to do. Um, Leah and like everyone I've like been around here, they know who they are, like they've all helped me in ways they might not realize. And like, I, like my parents always tell me, like, I'm grateful. When you do something good for people, it, yes, it, it makes them feel good, but it also makes you feel so good as a person. And there's no better feeling. And I honestly think it is the most rewarding thing in the world to be able to feel that. You feel it every single day. I have the, like the best job in the world. Best job. <laughs>
They open up lots of bank accounts and provide lots of credit cards, but that's not the reason they're there. They're there to help and make a difference in, in individuals' lives and help them navigate big life events. So they don't have targets. They're not behind a teller wicket. But linking it to our discussion about skills, um, Leah's job didn't exist three years ago. Um, and she works in a unique environment where the best of being human is required. Communication skills, emotional intelligence, critical thinking skills, problem solving. There's no template that tells her how to navigate Quasi's experience or issue. It's her applying her emotional intelligence, her care, her sensitivity, and helping him solve his problems is what makes her job and her such a special person. And I have not seen any digital tools or artificial intelligence that can codify what Leah has done with Quasi. So it's an example of how we're evolving roles and jobs and the bank to be relevant in society um, and the kinds of things that are needed for the future. How we think about invest in, and invest in skills for the future is one of the biggest single impacts we collectively can have on our collective prosperity. It's a topic and it's a conversation we believe is so important to us as a company, as a society, as a country, that it did become the catalyst for RBC Future Launch. Um, and yes, it's a big investment that we're making as an organization. It's a half a billion dollars. But more importantly, it's a challenge to ourselves to collaborate with you in the academic community, with governments, and quite frankly, challenge other business leaders and organizations to come together to prepare youth for a future world of work and increasingly to help existing workers develop the skills and capabilities that they need as their jobs change or industries change and evolve. You all know it, we commissioned a year-long study, Humans Wanted. John is, uh, is one of the key leaders of that work. And we may have to call upon uh, you, John, as a friend in the room as we get into discussion. But it is one of the most comprehensive labor studies ever done in the country. Examined more than 300 occupations and the skills needed to do them. We talked to students, workers, educators, policymakers, and other employers to understand how we can help ready the next generation for a different world of work. There are a number of key findings in the report, and I'm going to kind of zero in on three um, that where we've got the data, but also have some informed, uh, that have also helped us inform our perspective. The first finding is around job disruption and growth. We know that a number of forces, whether it's technology slash automation, artificial intelligence, global competitiveness and globalization, are fundamentally changing the nature of work. We all know that. And if you look specifically at Canada, Humans Wanted found more than a quarter of all jobs in the country are at risk of significant disruption by technology in the decade ahead, and that more than half will require different skills. If you look at the view of global leaders at, in Davos, where John and our CEO recently were, some believe that 100% of jobs will change as a result of the skills gap and the secular change that's happening. I tend to be more in that camp than the camp of a quarter of jobs. And I see it happening day in and day out with our employees and within our business. But technology isn't really a threat. It's an opportunity to solve a lot of big world problems. Um, and it's just something that we have to get ahead of. In fact, when you think of the threat of technology, you think about jobs. But in Canada, the economy is expected to add close to two and a half million jobs over the next four years. And filling those jobs is already a difficult challenge. And in our economic forecast for 2019, we, we cite businesses surveyed by the Bank of Canada and other groups said that they increasingly have a tough time filling, and, uh, filling jobs and hiring workers. And there's little relief in sight when you start thinking about accelerating retirement of boomers, flat or decreasing participation across young people, or geographic issues in moving people around the country, or insufficient immigration. And I believe that is a big one. I have the chance to travel in my job, whether you're in St. Mary's or Stratford, Ontario, or whether you're in Nanaimo, BC, 
or last week I was in Montreal, or whether you're sitting here in Toronto, every business owner that I talk to in round tables or in business visits say labor shortages, talent shortages are their number one issue. It's not just skills shortages, it's just talent shortages overall. It's real and it's here. That provides, I think, important context for the second key finding of Humans Wanted, the mix of skills needed for the future. Some of the most important jobs in demand today are data scientists, app developers, sustainability directors. Those jobs didn't exist 10 years ago, let alone five years ago. And then when you look ahead and you read some of the reports from the World Economic Forum that estimates that six out of 10 children entering primary school today in countries around the world will end up working in completely new job types that we can't even imagine today. So when you think of that, even those professions that we previously thought were immune to technology or digital disruption are going to see a fundamental shift. A lawyer today that might go through books of precedence in dealing with an issue you know, in the future is going to be using data and artificial intelligence or blockchain technologies to make their job easier. Even lawyers or accountants or doctors or nurses will see fundamental shifts in their jobs. We know that digital literacy is essential to all jobs, as is regular literacy, but it's much more than that. Humans, research, humans Wanted research shows a rising demand for foundational skills. So when you think of STEM to STEAM and you add the arts world, it is a far better definition of the kinds of skills that will separate good economies and good countries from great ones. And as you think of STEAM, um, one of the things that we did through Humans Wanted was an assessment of skills across those two and a half million job openings for the next four years. And what showed up was foundational skills, like Leah, foundational skills such as critical thinking, creativity, communication skills, and complex problem solving. Some of the skills that we saw with Leah are essential to job and career mobility. I think of our best employees today, they're adaptable, they're resilient from one customer to the next, and they're exceptionally resourceful at finding solutions. You can't, you can't codify that into an app. That needs to be built into the human condition. So when you look at the world through this lens, what emerges, and you take it even further and you get into technical skills, what emerges is a nuanced picture of future of jobs and the skills required. As much as technology will displace jobs, humans will be more essential than ever. Yet we're struggling with a major skills and a major talent shortage. Our CEO, Dave, calls it Canada's quiet crisis because it's just happening and it's getting more and more severe by the day. The third key finding in our report is that employers, educators, like we're doing in this room, government, need to do more individually and collectively to prepare youth and current workers as we shift from a jobs economy to a skills economy. And an economy where we can constantly be learning, training and upgrading so that people can move within and across jobs and across career streams. I believe it's less about the traditional notion of learning as acquiring knowledge or credentials and more about developing competencies and acquiring experiences over time. The Humans Wanted researchers analyzed the changing demands for Canadian skills across that two and a half million by the skills required to do the work. And ironically, and John's the expert on this, you can, be, you can group those skills into six broad clusters of skills. And I won't go into the detail, and I'll give a basic example, but when you group them across clusters of skills, not by industry or not by educational background or credentials, but skills, what you see is how skills apply, like skills apply across a wide range of jobs and how young people and older people might be able to move from one profession. I might have started my career as a machinist, a traditional machinist, but in later in my career, I become a robotics engineer within a firm 
because the fundamental skills are almost the same and there's very little skill upgrading required for me to move from one to the other. And that would be the example of what we're dealing with in our branches for our tellers or client advisors. They once process transactions, now they're teaching and educating clients on how to use digital tools and applications. What was once a service and a processor is today an educa educator, a problem solver, and an enabler of customers you know, in the digital world. Making career and skills mobility a priority is the key call to action from our report. What we're blessed by is the quality of incredible educational institutions in Canada, a culture of diversity and inclusiveness in this country, um, and the, the, the quiet or the persistent patience that you talked about, that we, we can do this. What's interesting, if you followed the media recently in Toronto with the GM plant closing in Oshawa, there was a CBC article with Matt Galloway on the, in the morning this week talking about the job losses in Oshawa and who wants to hire these GM workers is Netflix um, because they've done the math. They've done the math on the core skills required in the, with the several thousand jobs Netflix is going to add in Toronto is they've done the mapping and they believe there's an exceptional skill match between what these employees operated with in an auto plant that are required to work in a television and in a movie production space. We wouldn't have typically thought of that, but the skills match is almost the same. And in a world where you're starving for talent, and you've got two or 3,000 people sitting in Oshawa, and you think you can apply one or two additional skills, that's a pretty wise investment but it's a different way of looking at labor, it's a different way of looking at skills. I think the bigger problem we've got as a country is I don't think we're moving fast enough. And our own journey is an example of it. I think the problem and the opportunity is here today when you think of the labor shortages and you think of how fast the world is already changing. One of the first things that Dave did when he became our CEO is he introduced what we now call our collective ambition, and I was on the design team. And what the collective ambition is, is essentially a cultural compass for the company. And what Dave, who's a real thinker and a real reflector, back to discussion and reflection, was, was seeing is that the world was going to change radically, and this was four or five years ago. And the first thing that he did is he put a team together to say, what's the vision for this organization? What's the purpose that we want to live by, helping clients thrive and communities prosper? What are the goals that we want to live by? We don't want one-shot wonder growth that caused the financial crisis. We want sustainable growth. We want to deliver exceptional client experiences. And again, we want to make a difference in the lives of our customers and the communities that we're part of. So he created this compass this collective ambition blueprint to bring a purpose to life, our values, our goals, and our vision as being one of the most trusted institutions in the world to life. Why? Because strategy is, is very nebulous today and it's constantly changing because the world is changing so quickly. And you're gonna be constantly dealt, dealing as a business with what you, the strategic questions of what you wanna be five or 10 years from now with short-term demands that your shareholders or your regulators or the community is asking of. And you need a true north. You need a higher order that helps you make decisions and trade-offs when those short-term demands um, or some of the medium or long-term demands might take you off course otherwise. So the first thing we, we actually, he focused on was more about culture, purpose, vision, values. And what was quite fascinating at the time, and I was just new in this job, is we were really worried about getting into this conversation about how the industry would change with our frontline employees. Because we were worried that they would all be, we would actually provoke fear and exacerbate the problem. That they just want to run, run for the hills because I'm not going to have a job. So we first started focusing on culture. Then we went to strategy. And we worked really hard 
at developing a picture of what we thought our bank needed to be five years from now and 10 years from now. And we actually picked a business model and we describe our business model as, as a digitally enabled relationship bank. One that leverages the best of digital and the best of people. And, and as much as we believe that digital or data would fundamentally change the way our customers behaved, we also did a lot of soul searching that said, that continually told us that if we were going to be make a difference in the lives of clients and communities, that we needed people like Leah that were there where life is happening, applying empathy and their skills to help people navigate life's big decisions. Helping people like Quasi balance, you know, learn financial literacy or helping people like us in this room balance saving for our kids' education while saving for retirement. So we believed quite strongly early that our strategy was one of both human and digital. Um, when there were many naysayers that said, Kirk, your job is to close branches as fast as possible and just start downsizing people because there won't be people in banking. And even if I was wrong, and I still fundamentally believe that the human is actually fundamental to our strategy, even if I was wrong, no society and no business changes overnight and you need to bring people on the journey. And you can't change too fast but you also can't change too slow. So we worked on culture, then we worked on strategy, and then we brought 25,000, close to 30,000 employees on the journey with us. We actually have an exercise called the learning map. We did it two years ago. We took 30,000 employees through an exercise in local communities where we talked about our culture, we talked about our strategy, we talked about forces of change beyond banking that were changing the world, and everybody from a teller in a branch to a local commercial banker to their leaders went through this session of reflecting on the world around us, reflecting on the culture that we wanted to preserve and create, and reflecting on our business strategy so that they, in their mind's eye, could start to develop a picture of the organization we are and the organization that we want to become. Why was that so important? Is because as we asked people to adopt changes in their job or new skills and abilities, we believed, and I continue to believe, that we hire adults, we need to treat them like adults, and we need to apply a high degree of sensitivity and a high degree of transparency to, um, and bring them on the journey. And it's the difference between one CEO with a crystal ball rowing the ship and working hard to get 30,000 people with a sense of the future you're trying to create rowing in the same direction. Then in addition to that, we then developed a leadership map, a set of core capabilities that we thought were critical to leadership. But what was fascinating is as soon as we rolled out this model that spoke to drive to impact and prioritizing you know, for the greatest impact, being constantly adaptable and always learning, unlocking the potential of your people back to the 30,000 people versus the one, and creating a culture of speak up, this leadership model quickly moved from leaders to all employees. Because the philosophy held true, not the philosophy, the truth held true, is that we hire adults, and you've painted the picture of the future, and you literally need everybody in the organization, leaders, managers, and all employees, driving to impact, adapting quickly and learning, unlocking the potential of each other, and creating a culture of speak up that flattens your organization. One of the interesting things from a continuing ed standpoint, digital learning, you know, sounds pretty simple, but we got more mobile apps and more digital tools today than you can whack a stick at. And we're launching them out by the week. So how do you actually help Leah, who actually has to teach customers how to use that app, stay, stay current? We launched a digital learn site a few years ago. And the first 18 weeks, or eight weeks, sorry, not 18, it went viral and close to 18,000 users went active. 80% of our workforce went active in this digital learn site. 
they were hungry for because we had painted the picture of the future. We had started some work at the grassroots level and they knew that they needed to get on with it and overcome their individual learning fears. Today, this Digital Learn program has 30,000 active users, 79 courses available on it, and it's become the most visited site in our organization. What's so powerful about the continuous education part is that it's gamified, it's micro-learning, it's bite-sized, it only takes a couple of minutes to complete each module, so it's something that people can learn easily and real time. It's how our advisors are developing their digital fluency. So what about foundational skills? So we did this learning map two years ago, and we are currently in the process of going through the second version of that. And our employees and leaders are saying, we want to come back to this broader picture of forces of change, culture and strategy every couple of years so that we're traveling. But what we've embedded in it is a couple of things. One is this idea of a growth mindset, and it's a skill. To be resilient and adaptable, you have to be willing to look above the line and look for hope and opportunity rather than get stuck. And so there's a whole module that we're teaching around a growth mindset. And then the other thing that we're finding that we need to lean into is because head office and your frontline employees who really know the company can get really far from one another, and that's a death wish when you're in rapid change, is, is you can make mistakes, but you gotta be able to quickly identify them and resolve them. So you need, a key, uh, you need a culture of speak up. And so there's a whole module around radical candor, and some of you may know the teachings around radical candor, it's quite popular now, where we're just leaning into this, this idea Again, we hire adults, we want to create a culture where you speak up for the good of the organization, not wait for management and come and ask you. And so we're leaning into that skill development. There's a lot of other things that we're doing um, to try to support this. But what you've got is a multi-year investment in culture, strategy, um, bringing employees on the journey and painting the picture of the future, focusing on kind of leadership or behavioral skills that you need, and then continuing to go back to build upon it. Um, the other thing that's important, if you bring it into people's jobs and continuous learning, we, for about a decade now, have built a mechanism inside the organization where we know that a teller job can map, and, and over your five or 10 or 15 years, you can map to be a financial planner, a private banker, a commercial banker, et cetera. And, and we focused heavily on those career paths and educating people on those career paths so that we can create a culture of career progression and a culture of continuous learning that allows people to achieve their full potential as much as possible without having to leave Edmonton or Calgary or Regina or Saskatoon. It's a little harder in small rural communities, but it's still doable there too. It just takes longer. But what we've also done is we also changed people's jobs. We have a job design function in my team where we have about 160 different job types out in branches and commercial banking teams, et cetera. And we change each of those jobs five to 10% per year. We layer in new skills, we layer in new tools, we layer in changes in the way we measure them, and we just tweak them every year by five to 10%. We learned the hard way when you change the job 50 or 60%, you the customer get shocked and you lose heart for what we're doing as a customer, but we overwhelm employees and we trigger fear. But if you just change the job by five or 10% per year and you support people through that five or 10%, if you do the compounded growth rate on a 10% change per year, by the time you get to year seven, it's a fundamentally different job. So our tellers and branches today used to process transactions and do it in a nice way. Today, they're enablers, they're educators, and they're advisors to customers on more complex things. That happened with the same workforce. But it also happened with many of those tellers or client advisors getting promoted and moving up in the organization. We're the only bank that has not taking, taken a severance restructuring charge for the displacement of frontline employees. Why? Because we promote them, we constantly reskill them, 
and we manage through natural attrition the reshaping of our workforce. So I'll summarize. Um, I think the work that you're doing as in continuing ed is fundamental to our future for existing employees and for lifelong learning. Um, you are so in demand, and I think the partnership that we're trying to establish together is critical for today and for the future. Um, I think we need to think about learning as an ecosystem between what happens at work and what are the incremental learnings that they might need from institutions like yourself. I think the government can play a very important role in terms of being able to measure not just history, but also project and help us see the future more clearly and what the needs are, immigration, et cetera. Um, so I think the work that you're doing is key. Um, there's a couple of other examples that I will give you, and it's less, it's a, it's less specific to um, continuing ed, but it really does speak to skills versus jobs. And, uh, and it's really our plug and my plug for uh, work integrated learning and co-op programs. Um, we have several hundred co-op placements or work integrated pr placements across the country. Um, our technology division hires about 700 co-ops or summer students a year. Now it's a big organization in a bank, it's probably 15,000 people, but it's about 700. One of the things that Bruce Ross, our CIO, launched is a program called Amplify, where these co-op students and summer students are put into teams in the summer and we give them real hard bank problems to solve. No management hierarchy, just five or six students working on a real bank problem. No constraints, the world is their oyster. And they solve real business problems. Last summer, they worked on issues from predictive analytics capabilities to data management policies and cybersecurity, one of the greatest threats of the, of the planet right now. These Amplify students filed 15 patents at the end of the summer. Not management, not engineers that work for the company for 25 years, student, summer students, co-op students that were put into teams to solve real problems. They brought their critical thinking skills, they brought their creativity, we taught them collaboration skills and communication skills because they didn't bring all of those and we filed 15 patents out of it. It's actually quite humbling if you put yourself in the shoes of a business leader and you think we've got these huge management structures and layers upon layers, and if you could just get rid of all of us and hire teams of students, we could probably get a hell of a lot more done a lot faster um, than we could have ever imagined. It's powerful what can be done when you focus on skills and when you focus on the problems and the opportunities that you face not traditional silos, traditional hierarchies, not traditional mandates. Um, you truly do take a creative approach. We're also doing work with uh, Grow with Google, and we're bringing that into the workplace. Um, the Future Skills Center that Ryerson um, is, is leading work on is quite profound. There's lots of great examples, but I think in closing, um, I think the Humans Wanted report has some very compelling findings as Canadians, as government, as academics and as businesses that we need to zero in on. I think the problem and the opportunity is now, not five years from now. Um, it's gonna take a collaborative effort. It's gonna take a, a quiet or a persistent patience for us to do this together, but it's now. And, uh, and I don't think it's just an issue of young people. It's also about how we help people have confidence, hope, and reskill for the future. Um, and uh, as I started, um, I'd rather be in Canada than Barbados, and Barbados is a beautiful country um, and a nice warm place right now. But we, we have an opportunity to, I think, buck the trend in the world um, and not only build the skills and the workforce that we need tomorrow and in the future, but we also have, I think, an obligation to build the talent that's going to build the next economy. And it's happening right before our eyes. And if we don't do that, there are much bigger problems that this country is going to face. So thank you very much.
Well, Kurt, thank you. Um, thank you for your thoughtful and thought-provoking messages today. Uh, so many concepts for all of us to consider. And uh, we appreciate that you've enlightened us on a major employer's perspective on what's going on around skills. Um, you've also shared with us some interesting perspectives about employees. And of course, this is a major group of students for all of us that work in continuing education. I think we truly do appreciate RBC's investment to enable collaboration. And uh, I, I found it very interesting how you described strategy as being a combination of human plus digital. So uh, we are really grateful for what you've shared with us today. And now for the next, I'm going to say the next 20 to 25 minutes, we're just going to have some questions to discuss with Kirk, uh, Sheila LeBlanc, and Tracy Taylor O'Reilly. Uh, we've got some questions to focus on the report and how it pertains to university continuing education. Take notes. Um, if we have time, we will uh, take a break for questions, but then there will also be an opportunity after, during lunch, Kirk will be staying with us. I think you're joining us for lunch, that you can discuss that with him. So, first question. Humans Wanted focuses on young Canadians. Yet, according to a lot of the research, including a recent article in the Globe and Mail, Canadians of all ages are at risk in preparing for the disruption to the way work will be changed by automation in the coming decade. Barriers include lack of childcare, cost and conflicting work schedules. And these, these, these are barriers that keep people from pursuing uh, continuous learning. So Kirk, from an employer's perspective, tell us how can these barriers be resolved? Specific reference to childcare and schedules. Um, I think there's a dialogue that employers need to bring into the workforce, and, and it starts with creating an environment of trust where employees can can talk openly about um, the, the diverse dimensions that are affecting their life. Um, it's really hard to run a call center today where you actually have to book a, you know book a break um, to go to the washroom, and because it's it's pretty disrespectful from a human rights perspective, but. The demands on people's lives from elder care issues to child care issues to other demands are real. And either you solve for it as an employer or the employee ultimately leaves you. And, and we, again, we've already talked about labor shortages. We've created an employee resource group across the country. Many of many of you wouldn't be well aware of employee resource groups that are diversity focused, women, visible minority, LGBT. We've created one called iCare. And it's about just creating a trusting environment where these things can get talked about and where we also help managers become more sensitive in coming up with creative solutions to help manage around it. Because um, if you don't bring it out into the open, ultimately the employee will quietly leave and go somewhere else. So that, you know, that's a bit of an example of how we're trying to solve for that specific issue. But I have a broader perspective, and I think it's shared by John and you know, my colleague at the, at the back, Lucy, and our CEO is we're only as good as the communities and you know that we're part of. And we're only as good as the health of the Canadian economy and the Canadian workforce. Um, so, you know, we've got to give back. And we've got to, you know, we've got to be part of this discussion. If we don't help build the next economy, what does that mean for our long-term viability as an organization? Um, and if we don't make a true difference in the lives of our customers, then, then we're just profit taking. And, and, you know, it's just a longer term view of our role in society and a role that we believe business leaders should have. The other is, is what I talked about in terms of culture um, and strategy, is if you truly do want to run your business for the long term, you should have a point of view on the kind of culture that you need to have. You need to have a point of view on what you think your business might look like five or 10 years from now, whether you're a retail store, whether you're a trucking company, a manufacturer, or a bank. And only when you spend time on that 
do you start to see how important it is that you bring your employees on the journey with you um, and, and that you do everything from work integrated learning to help young people have the social skills and the technical skills for the future, but that you bring your, you bring your current employees on the path with you and you upskill them and you treat them like adults. Um, John and I had the opportunity to sit with the Chamber of Commerce um, in Niagara Falls a while ago. And one of the greatest pieces of feedback we got from the chamber heads was, oh my God, the way you change jobs five or 10% per year is a story that we need to tell more of from a continuing ed and from a reskilling perspective. And not for the, not for the microphone, not for the mic or the video, is in the absence of that, you create social unrest over time. And in the absence of that, those people that don't have hope vote for the wrong political party, they lose hope, they lose trust in management, they lose trust in government, and then you end up in a protectionist world that can actually, over the medium term, hurt them even more. So I, I think employers have a responsibility to the economy and to their industry and to bring their employees on the journey, both for the success of their com company, but also the long-term viability of, of the economy. Sheila and Tracy, and I'll start with Sheila. Um, how does your unit at University of Calgary remove these barriers that we're talking about around access to learning? Thank you, Carolyn. And I guess I'll first by start by saying, Kurt, I'm so impressed with what RBC is doing in this area. But one of the challenges I see is my mic on. No, it's not working. It's not working. It's not working. Then I'll put it down and I will speak up. I will use my teacher voice. <laughs> All right. So I very much admire what RBC is doing, but also realize that small to medium businesses have different um, resources and opportunities as far as what they can do to support their employees go through the digital journey. And I actually believe that's part of the role that we can play as partners with the small to medium organizations. We have an opportunity to work with them to take some of these same practices that a large organization might have the opportunity to do in-house, but we can collaborate and actually do in partnership. Now to re remove some of those barriers specifically, I think each of us work very hard in our institutions to try and ensure that the learning is accessible by whether it be through timelines, making sure it's evenings and weekends if uh, people are working weekdays, making sure that flexibility is there in modality. So could they take it online, blended, face-to-face? -face? What kind of choices that I think our units are actually the experts in within our organizations? We're the leaders and champions of that in the higher education system. So that, that's one way we remove barriers. But another way is also working with the philanthropic communities in order to create bursaries for those in need. Uh, we talk about the need for newcomers to actually become productive members of our economy. And in many cases, there's a skills gap, whether it be languages or whether it be actually preparation for working in the Canadian culture or whether it actually be true skills gaps. And if we're going to actually make a difference in that space, we need to find ways to allow access to those folks. They don't come in many cases with the financial means to access the type of learning that they need. So by actually creating bursaries, by creating programs that work towards bridging folks into employable skills and making them job ready, it's a way we contribute. Specifically at the University of Calgary, we do all that stuff. And we actually have an opportunity to do so much more. I, I believe there's so many places where we can actually make a difference. And it's truly just a time, money, and finding the, the trifecta between how do we really strategically work with government investment, with employers, and with the university to make those things happen in all the different fields of practice that's needed in our economy. My two bits. <laughs> so, can you add to that? We didn't coordinate this, but I, I'd like to add to a couple of the points that... Oh, did uh, I have the same ones? Yeah, you did. Um, in, with some of the digital skills gaps that are emerging today, what we're finding is the cost of developing these programs and the cost of maintaining them is astronomical. It's not, it's not like continuing education was three or four years ago. And 
Organizations like RBC also don't necessarily want to duplicate those kinds of programs in-house, so there's definitely mm -hmm. an opportunity for partnership. There are only so many subject matter experts that, you know, there's, a, there's a, a, an update of our curriculum on some of these programs every eight weeks. Just keeping up with it is unlike anything that we've ever seen. So dealing with the cost from the student perspective is challenging. The programs actually are getting a little bit more expensive. And to your point, the university has a role in that, but going back to your trifecta, which seems to be the word of the day, I think, I, I think we all together have a role in working with particularly uh, our federal government and our employers in terms of the issue of the, the awareness of the funding. So there are three, uh, a trifecta of potential funders of these kinds of programs. The employers have a responsibility Obviously, individuals have a responsibility, uh, but there is a responsibility uh, of our governments, both provincial and federal, and we are quite a bit behind, particularly at the federal level, in some other countries that have taken a leadership role over the last couple of years uh, in terms of not only putting forward some funding, but ensuring that there's benchmarking of employer support for training, uh, ensuring that there's a communication strategy to individuals to let them know that you need to save for this. This is going to be something that you're cycling through in a way that we've never seen before in careers, um, to communicate with employers. Like there's, there's a variety of things that other countries have done. And I think together, we need to work toward advancing that agenda to ensure that there is additional funding, both personally and government. And uh, about a year or so ago, in December of 2017, our federal government received a white paper that actually suggested a $2.5 billion investment mm -hmm. in uh, skills training that should be shared by, by those three. But they identified the gap as $15 billion a year that we collectively need to spend in our country over the next 10 years to close that uh, skills gap. So I think we in continuing education have a role in working with both government and with employers like RBC who want to take a leadership role in this regard to try and move that agenda forward together. If we do it ourselves, we're seen as self-serving. If we do it together, we're seen as trying to solve this problem. Agreed. So I am going to skip the second question and go to uh, the, the question around um, the recommendation that humans wanted was a proposal for employers, employees, and government to finance and manage lifelong learning and learn new skills in the same way that we save for retirement. And so Tracy and Jilly, you both have um, unique situations at your institution, like all of us here. Tracy, how are you enabling that conversation at York? Well, I think uh, that's a conversation that we actually need to have nationally. So uh, I've had the great uh, pleasure in the last few months of being able to talk in a number of venues about this. And I happen to have a president who sits on the board of Universities Canada who has a, a very strong um, interest in taking national leadership on this. So I, I hope that we'll see this question being addressed in the next federal budget that's uh, only weeks away. Uh, but I also, as I said earlier, I, I, I think this is a first step. It's also not enough. We have a number of countries doing this, but providing uh, infrastructure around this in terms of engaging the stakeholders in, in actually um, uh, engaging in the lifelong learning journey. But to the skills matching example that Kirk gave, it's also knowing where to go next. And, and so the paper also identified that there is a gap between uh, where employees identify their skills today and understanding that if they add those one or two skills, they can make quite a leap to a different sector or a different kind of role. And so we also have a role, I think, in uh, doing the research in terms of determining what those pathways are and then disseminating that research and ensuring that we as continuing education are then helping to fill those gaps. <coughs> 
Well, but Sheila, what would you say about that in terms of your institution or sure. even provincially? Thank you. I, I'd love to build on that. And I, I fully agree a national agenda is one that's needed. But we live in Canada that has a provincial higher education structure. And because of that, I, I felt one of our key opportunities in, in Alberta was to really look at how do we engage our provincial government in this conversation as well. And, and most recently, there's been some movement on that front as it relates to funding out of our provincial government in short cycle digital skill development that had evidence-based information that said these particular competencies are missing in our marketplace. In Alberta, as many of you know, with the downturn of the, the price of, of crude and oil, the Alberta government has been quite motivated to think about different ways we can stimulate and transition our economy into different sectors. And in light of that, the conversation that we were able to have, and, and myself and a few of my other colleagues uh, spoke, speaking to the provincial government, uh, were able to encourage them to create calls for proposals and fund multiple million dollars of program development for short cycle training and the recipients I mean there's five of us in this room that were recipients of those grants to start bringing that uh, developed programming into our marketplace short cycle buildable skills oriented and that collaboration was being done between the provincial government with uh, a number of our industry partners and our academic community and and going back to I'll use Elizabeth Cannon's my esteemed former president uh, the triple helix is what she calls it so we say the trifecta government industry and, and and higher education how do we create power out of that and we've seen some progression in Alberta uh, which I, I'm delighted to share uh, it's certainly a place where I think I'm hopeful that we're going to go the next step because the next step which I'm advocating for at a provincial level and having wonderful converse, conversations with our uh, assistant deputy ministers is about now we need to create access because it's great to have programming that we know is expensive mm -hmm. we're having a conversation about how do we share that programming amongst institutions instead of being proprietary because it's expensive to build tech programming to maintain the half-life of that knowledge is shrinking we need to change it and update it so frequently uh, we need to leverage that across a sectoral perspective like share across different institutions we recreate the wheel in the Academy too often within our own units instead of saying this investment can be leveraged strategically leveraged on things that are publicly funded is I guess the the suggestion at hand and we're working towards doing that in Alberta at this time as a bit of a trial to see how that will work in certain environments but once we've got those developed programs we still need to get student access and not all students can afford to take a program that they need to get the next job they might be at a point now they've been laid off for a period of time they might be at a point where um, you know they're just getting by and paying bills in a job that they're underemployed at so funding for bursaries for strategically aligned workforce development programming is my next agenda that I, we're, we're, we're working hard on in Alberta and I, I know there's a appetite for the conversation and I think we're going to get there that's the next pocket of money depending on the next election of course but uh, the the hopes are is that's the other pillar because mm -hmm. you can create it and you could but if they don't come the skills aren't developed and we need to find mechanisms to allow access for the talent to continuously be developed I offer that as an so, example. So very good. Kirk, you, did, you, you told us in your presentation that there were multiple uh, stakeholders involved in the conversation around developing the report. And you've also given us some really good examples of how RDBC is, um, is working to bring all of the employees on this journey to continue their careers. From your point of view, what would you recommend to us as leaders in continuing education? How can we collaborate effectively with employers like RBC or any of the other small to medium sized companies in our region to influence provincial and federal policy? And I'm looking over at Wendy from University of <laughs> Canada. So tell us what, you, what your advice would be. Um, a couple of things. One is we need forums like the Business and Higher Education Forum where we come together, right? The round table and where we, and where we come together provincially and nationally um, across government, across the academic community. Um, 
young people and continuing ed um, and industry because it's, it's a shared accountability. Um, and when you create the dialogue horizontally, you reduce the risk that you're gonna duplicate effort or that you become slow and siloed. So I think things like the Business Education Higher Roundtable, those types of forums are critical. Um, so that gets you going horizontally, but you also gotta be flatter, right? Um, and I think between the government, but if I was in your shoes, I wouldn't leave it to government. We got, we, we've got to measure, we've got to measure, and we've got to report and monitor far more actively. So you can start with, you know, the skills tool that John and the team have created to, to look at more of these foundational skills and where the gaps are and how those gap, potential gaps might be relevant in your economy in Calgary today versus, you know, versus Toronto, and, and then look in the mirror and say, do we actually have solutions on the shelf uh, to help employers solve for those. So I, I think there is a measuring and monitoring component to it, but I also just think it's, it's constant discussion and dialogue around what the issues and the challenges are. And sometimes they're gonna be the fundamental skills, um, and sometimes they're gonna be technical skills um, that need to be closed. Like we would, a technical example, our technology division right now is gonna stop coding um, in this online banking, banking platform or this online banking capability. And we're gonna move to a newer that works for mobile, bank, for mobile devices as well as online. It's a newer technology platform. Well, we've got 400 people that know how to code in this world. So we can find a private firm that can help upgrade their skills on this new platform, or we can go to local colleges and universities to help us do that. But fundamentally, if we're gonna live our purpose and our strategy, we better help those 400 employees shift. Um, so that's about being real time, because that's happening, it's a decision we've made in the last couple of weeks. And we don't wanna leave those employees behind. The other is a more longstanding one. I'd hire as many people as possible that have their mutual funds accreditation or their financial planning designations which are becoming foundational technical skills within the financial industry. So you might have traditionally looked at it and said, the business program within the university is, well, we don't go into technical. We do foundational business learning. Well, unless you start bolting these things onto your programs, you're actually missing you know, a major channel of career opportunity. It could be an elective for a student, but unless you bring in some of that accreditation into your business programming, whether it's the continuing ed group that does it or the traditional you know, undergrad group, you're missing the ability to have somebody that much more ready for the workforce. And that would be a, you know, an example. So it is about being more real time, flattening, having more candid dialogue about what the needs are. But I also think there's a role to better monitor and measure and report. Yes, we agree with you on that. <laughs> Okay, now you mentioned growth mindset, and I feel that the next question, and I think it might have to be our last question because I want to give the, everybody in the audience a chance to uh, You mentioned growth mindset, and all of us in the room, we're immersed in what we see happening and what's going on right now. How do we enable all Canadians? I'm, I'm thinking about the people that live in Oshawa who recently found out that they were going to lose their jobs at GM. But this is happening in a lot of places across Canada. How do we get those people, and you did this at RBC, but how do we get them to learn about and prepare for the coming skills uh, revolution? Just maybe one suggestion from each one. What would you recommend? <laughs> You guys go. <laughs> Tag. <laughs> you have time for more, but I just want to give mm. yeah, yeah, no, you yeah. yeah. mm. Well, there, there's certainly a role for us in our own communities to, um, to make this visible, to make this public. There have been some nice articles. To, uh, the uh, Andy's president wrote an, an article in his local paper with Alex Usher, for example. Uh, it raising raising the awareness around the um, the skills gap, the issues, and, and a bit of a call to action. So I see us certainly in our own communities having that ability to work 
not only uh, ourselves, but with our university president's office and our PR offices in terms of raising awareness of what we do have, because we are often a well-kept secret within our own universities, as well as within our own communities. I came up with an idea to this when I was listening to Kirk. When he was talking about the change management or engagement strategy they did with their employees, right? We talked about taking 25,000 people or 30,000 people and giving them some basic understanding of what's going on on the, you know, in the economy, what's taking place, and then how it impacts them and the vision within their organization. I could see a, an adapted version of that actually being made available through um, uh, employment offices. So all of these folks that are now find themselves unemployed, where they first go is to go get their unemployment, their, their employment funds. And at that part, at that point, they're at a, in a situation where thinking about reemployment and actually in, as a, a, some form of educational component, whether that's online or a small workshop that they were all given to start saying about this is what's happening in the economy these days. This is what's happening in the world of work. And, and here's some opportunities, and that's where Con Ed could come mm -hmm. in, in your mm -hmm. local market. Here's mm -hmm. all of these short cycle programs that you could be taking and that are aligned with our strategic gaps. And because they're aligned with our strategic gaps, they're free. Oh, that's a vision. <laughs> well, how do we do that? <laughs> yeah, I, I would build up. So I think the employment offices are important. Um, I think the employer has an obligation. Um, I hope to God that GM is thinking ahead of this and is inviting in Netflix or the employment office and GM are using the skills calculator that John and the Humans Wanted created so that they're proactively, yes, employee's gonna get a severance package. Yes, the company's gonna shut down. Those, that's, that's the below the line. Those, that's just the hard part of the change. But how they, how they lean in with the employment office or as a company to help humans navigate the change and whether they bring in Netflix or whether they actually help em every employee do skills mapping, um, I think is, is, um, is an employer responsibility and it's not just the, it's not just the you know, employment office responsibility. Um, is there a policy component of that potentially? You could create government policy yeah, around I'm just saying that, that if you I'd are love laying to say off that people. that all employers would do that. Yeah. But it, how do we create a, a culture where that's an expectation? Yeah. Where we actually you know, transition Canadian business culture to say you own part of this transition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think there's nothing wrong with holding companies accountable to uh, a higher order. Agreed. I feel many questions inside of me to continue <laughs> on, but it's not fair. So I want to open it up to the room. I think. It's just about 10 to 12, so we'll maybe take two, three questions at the most. So Chrissy, call on. Sure. So I'm Chrissy from the University of Toronto, and I just want to maybe get your advice, Kirk, because one of the things that happens often is when industry approaches the university, they go to the academic units. They have these long, drawn-out conversations about how to connect things, and the reflex isn't to consider continuing it. We come in late in the game, and then it's like, we need a solution in a month. Can you turn it around? And wow, you guys are wizards. But how do we elevate the presence of continuing ed among industry leaders to think of us as a first reflex? Well, inviting people like me to your session certainly helps. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't live in your world, so I'm by no means the expert. But I, when you guys were talking about structure, earlier in you know th this morning I was reflecting on that and um, one as a university I'd be doing a lot of work with the front office to help employers navigate your institution um, I'd be doing a lot of work at the front front office to help employers navigate and you know even we do this now we call it teaming and it's pretty basic stuff but rather than just sending out one advisor to see you will send out three or four an expert on A, an expert on B, an expert on C, and an expert on D. And then we'll have a broad-based conversation with you about where you're gonna take your business or where you wanna take your family. And then we'll figure out exactly, through us as experts, what the right solution is for you. And I would hope that you would work hard through your front office, but across the institution to try to bring multiple experts to the table that can actually I posted this on LinkedIn a couple of weeks ago, not listen to respond, 
listen to understand and then respond you know, with ideas and solutions. So I think the way you organize yourselves and come to the table um, is really important. What's interesting, if I look at our world and we're structured a bit differently than most banks, you have a mortgage division, you have an investments and a savings division, you have, and that's how we measure the bank. So in your case, it might be your business school and it might be your medical school and it might be your law school, but we have our different divisions. But the interaction with the customer across all of those divisions is my responsibility. I actually work on behalf of each of those divisions but I also work on behalf of Canadians and customers. And I gotta constantly balance the two. And so I'm constantly reminding the mortgage group that you're actually forgetting certain things in the local market or you're forgetting other needs of the customer and forcing these divisions to work together. That's part of my job. And so when I think of your world, you might teach business, if, you might be in the faculty teaching business courses in HR, but quite candidly, whether it's an undergrad course or a graduate school course or a continuing ed course, it, it, the discipline is HR, but the delivery is just a different human being at a different point in their life cycle, but it's the same content. And so, you know, getting out of the mindset that undergrad and graduate and continuing ed are fundamentally different and being able to work more horizontally or fluidly as an organization and come to the table as a team to kind of come up with creative solutions, I think is really important. But I, I can feel for you because I, I have a sense of how law firms or universities or hospitals you know, are organized and it's tough. But unless we, the common theme here is both the trifecta but also this ability to work horizontally is key. Right. Yes. Um, so the question I had, uh, kind of a question in common, kind of a comment to the previous statement. Um, what I'm seeing here is, and correct me if I'm wrong, is moving towards kind of the new economy and the, and the new model is that we are still looking at a tiered <coughs> economic system in the sense that we have, for the lack of a better word, the post-secondary jobs and careers and we have the trades and services. And really what we're really looking for is not transgressive movement between them, but really lateral movement. So we having a, a cashier moving towards kind of a, a, a checkout supervisor, for example, right? Uh, so, so, so they are transitional uh, movements. The same thing goes with the post-secondary jobs, is that these are transitional movements. The mechanical engineer now could transition towards uh, a smart car engineer in the future. So I think what this really opens the door for is if we look at traditional faculty, traditional faculties will most likely continue doing what they need to do because they are providing those fundamental skills for the post-secondary sector. Mm -hmm. Our role is we have the ability to provide that transition based on the level of education that the person has. So you know, whether it's post-secondary or whether it's trades and services, I think that continuing education units uh, will be in a much better position in the next 20 years to be able to take part in those conversations for transition. So it's really a statement, but I'm wondering if you can comment on that. Any thoughts? I would agree fully that uh, the additional skills and competencies added to foundational degrees or foundational skills that they learned in employment is a place that we play a significant role because we assist in, on an ongoing basis, developing those individual components and allowing people to leverage them. So uh, agreed, but it is also, I wouldn't say it's 10, 20 years, I think it's now. Yeah, I mean, we're this significant amount of the specific skill gaps that are being identified, and it's really thinking about micro components. We call them micro credentials in the ac academic world, but it's really about skill segments and being able to have. And I, I love the example from RBC: a few minutes in learning. I mean, that's that's even further down than we've ever even considered. We're talking hours. We some you know short cycle hours, but that whole idea of having little pieces of knowledge that you build off 
is significant. And They're I, just grains of sand. Yeah. They're just grains of sand that build into something bigger over time. That's a beautiful analogy. And, and, and I, I'd actually throw one last pitch in here as it relates to that. And, and because we are university continuing education, very specifically university continuing education, our faculties are the theoretically the, the generators of new knowledge. Right? They're, they're doing the, the hands-on research, generating new knowledge, new ideas. And so many of our universities have been focused on knowledge translation in terms of patents, in terms of commercializations of new knowledge. Uh, it's actually another element that I, we need to tap in horizontally is actually translation of knowledge into skills and practice. The nuggets of that as each industry, as each um, function, as each job is changing, is there's a little nugget of knowledge that needs to be added on. We need to be there, we need to identify it, and we need to find ways to translate that into practice. And if we can actually share it, because it's a publicly funded investment and do it across our economy, we can power ourselves to be economic leaders Leaders, which is, I think, the big picture we're all talking about, is how do we make sure that we stay ahead in this massive time of change? So that was a, a transition rod, but it was a build-off, I, I think, very much now and exponential growth in the, the short cycle training. If, if I can just build on, on the action coming out of that, uh, one of the concerns that I have with the announcement of the Future Skills Council last week was I sat down with my president a couple of days after it was announced and we noticed that there was not a single university listed on the Future Skills Council and there was certainly no university continuing education and we will be the deliverers of that. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the knowledge translation to the people who are then delivering it, how do we close that gap? Uh, so I've spoken to one of the co-chairs of the Future Skills Council and I will be connecting you with her uh, to ensure that CAUS and perhaps some of our members, because there's a diversity here, uh, are included in their public consultation, which is going to be happening over the next few months. Can, can, can I comment? Because yes. I, I, I know you said last one, but I, <laughs> I, I, I do want to react, Rod. Like, well, firstly, I started as a teller and you know, and I took all I took all the jobs nobody wanted around the country, and you know, and then went back to school and learned and kind of grew out of what you know would have been seen as a clerical role into kind of management roles and strategy roles. So, um, I think we need to create. Firstly, as all of us, um, we need to create hope for young people. The other is um, is our client, our teller, once teller is today truly working shoulder to shoulder, teaching and educating clients on how to use digital tools, and is actually advising clients on some basic but important life needs. That is a fundamentally different skill set. That is a higher order advisory and human skill set than going from being a teller to a clerk. So those are higher order human jobs as that job has transformed itself. And again, to my first point, it's possible for that teller to become a manager or a senior leader you know, in Canada today. I believe that, if they have the ambition and the hope and so on. The other is I'd go back to Humans Wanted and the skills mapping that was done across two and a half million jobs and the six clusters. Like what, I wish I had some real-time examples, but see John at, at break. But what blows your mind when you look at these skills clusters is you can have somebody that's in a very technical, call it trades type job today, where they could go into a, what we would consider a higher order job, that the actual gap between their trades job and the higher order job is actually not that far. And I think one of the biggest risks we have is, is that we, we, we we're held back by our traditional thinking about industries or job types versus skills and how they can be combined and recombined. And that's what's so fascinating about the skills calculator and the skills mapping is the degree of separation between somebody in healthcare and somebody in a, a bricklayer or a tradesperson is not that far. And, and it's like one skill more that if you develop it, you can actually make the shift. Part of it solves for the structural shift in the economy that is not that big a deal to go from GM on the line to Netflix in knowledge work. 
um, it's not that big a deal to go from being a teller to an educator and a teacher. Um, so part of it is the structural shift that's occurring, but part of it is, is the career mobility it creates for people over time as they create new opportunities to earn more money and reach their full potential. I think you, I think, I think you can do both. You build off that. You say that if you, the cultural paradigm is actually held back by us often as hiring employers, where we don't see that. I and, see it. And also, competency checklists, they're all technical skills. Right. And, and there's also then the risk of leaving significant parts of our society behind if they're not actually given those opportunities to make that shift. It's, it's a huge risk. Yeah. So, <laughs> I have a feeling that this conversation could go all day long, and probably for many days, but I want to say thank you to Tracy and Sheila. What you said definitely resonated for us, and uh, I think you've identified some things for us to think about in our own <laughs> units. For Kirk, and I want to point out John as well, Thank you for including us in the conversation. Um, I reached out to David Mackay back in, I think it was June or July, and he was so gracious in um, working with us to have you come and speak to us today. And this has been an interesting, and I would say maybe unique opportunity for us at the Deans and Directors meeting to have uh, an employer like RBC speak to us, but so many of your messages are what we need to know and so um, I do hope that we will continue to have conversations. I can tell that Wendy is just dying to have a conversation <laughs> about this. We will be hearing from her this afternoon. But lots to think about. Um, there's opportunity for us, obviously, right now, between now and 1.30, to connect with our special guests here and one another. It's time for lunch. And at 1.30, we will be coming back in here for the ProAction Cafe. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.